Good morning, everyone. Glad to welcome each of you here today. Praise the Lord. It is shining outside, the sun, right? And the sun, S-O-N, is shining inside and in your hearts, if you know the Lord. Praise the Lord. It's not raining or snowing or freezing rain here. And praise the Lord, there is heat here in the auditorium. Wasn't necessarily true throughout the whole building, but they're, they're working on that. And uh, we're glad that you're here. We're glad to welcome the folks that are with us online. Uh, I'm going to ask the uh, praise team to come to the platform. If you're here today and have never filled out one of these connection cards, if you would be kind enough to do that, they're on the back table. You can pick one up and then fill it out, drop it in the offering plate, and uh, then uh, take a gift bag along if you haven't gotten one of those yet. And if you're watching online, you can d fill out a connection card on our website, capitalbible.com. We'd be happy to connect with you, and uh, if you'd like to get our e-bulletin, we send that out every Wednesday, and we send it to people who request it. So if you don't get it right now, whether you're here in the auditorium or online, and you'd like to get the e-bulletin, it's just prayer, prayer request and come, upcoming events and a lot of different news items, a lot of praise and prayer requests. Uh, just give us your email address. Just say, send me the weekly e-bulletin, and we'll add you to that distribution list, and we'll be happy uh, to send it to you. I'm finishing up a series today uh, that we're, we call Time, a series on time. And today's uh, message is called, uh, What Day Is It? What Day Is It? So why don't we stand up and sing a song about thanking the Lord today. And uh, enjoy it. says it's a good thing to give thanks to the Lord. Amen? Amen. I come before you today And there's just one thing that I
Amen. You may be seated. The Bible says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. And we're glad that we can say thank you to the Lord. I do not know what people do without the Lord. And people who don't know the Lord, I can't imagine how they manage, especially in today's chaotic, crazy, upside down world, right? If I didn't know the Lord, I wouldn't know what to do. But because I know the Lord, he's got it all taken care of. See, I don't need to, I don't need to worry about it. I don't need to fret. And that's a great thing. Um, those of you that are here in the auditorium, if you have Facebook on your phone and could do us the honor of a Facebook check-in, uh, just go to your Facebook on the phone and it, it says, what, what's up? What do you want to do? And you, you can choose check-in and then choose Capital Bible Church, and it'll come up. It lets everybody know that we're here and uh, having church. And uh, folks that are watching online, if you'd like to uh, have a copy of the bulletin for today with the outline, that's available in the YouVersion Bible app. Now, there's a lot of Bible apps, and I'm not paid to give a commercial for YouVersion, but let me just tell you, YouVersion is the app that I use, the Bible app that I use, because... It's very, very full. It's, it's got hundreds, literally, of translations. And it also has lots of Bible reading plans. It has lots of great videos, scriptural videos. Uh, we also have the ability in the events section of that to put our digital church bulletin every week. It's uploaded by one of our members. And if you are at home and would like to have the copy of the outline, you'd have to just go to version and you, on, on the iPhone, you go across the bottom to this little dot where it says more, and you, you go, find events, and we're there, right in the events, top one, all right? So, again, if you can give us that check-in, we appreciate it. If you don't do Facebook and you don't care, that's fine, okay? We're, I understand. See, here's the deal, folks. Every, what you have to do is find, if you want to have as a Christian any kind of effective witness, then find what works for you, okay? And any way that you witness is better than no way, all right? So... You don't have to do it the way I do it or the way somebody else does it, but just find a way that you can do it, that you can witness for the Lord, that you can let people know you're not ashamed to be a child of God, that you're not ashamed to be a Bible-believing Christian. Find the way that works for you, and then ask God to help you to share that knowledge, that information. We do appreciate all those that give, people give here at the church through the offering plate on the table, people give through the mail. They give through automatic bank drafts. People give online. And uh, if you gave last year and uh, are a regular tender, then your giving statement is in the mailboxes that are outside there in the, in the lobby right around the corner. If you're not a regular tender, that should have been mailed to you. If you didn't get yours, uh, you can call the church office this week and let us know that you're looking for it, and we'll be happy to... Uh, have that run down for you, all right? But everybody should have gotten them, I think, depending upon the good old U.S. mail. <laughs> and we won't go into that dark hole, all right? All right, now we're gonna thank the Lord right now for the people that he's raised up. There's some folks that have come through surgeries and uh, are here. Other folks are at home uh, recovering. And uh, many folks are recovering from viruses and flus and coughs and sore throats. Um, if you know someone that needs prayer, if you lift your hand with me, I'll be glad to remember that person before the Father, and uh, he knows, and he cares. You say, how do you know he cares? Because he said he did, does, that's how. He says it throughout his word, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. First Peter 5, 7. Let's look to the Lord together now in believing prayer and thank God for his goodness and for the fact that he cares. Father, I thank you that you are a prayer hearing and prayer answering God. We thank you that you're not distant, you're not far away, 
you haven't left us by ourselves. We thank you that you delight to receive the intercession, the conversations, the prayers of your people. Help us to recognize that we can pray without ceasing. We can be in a constant attitude, communion of prayer so that it's not, it's not hindered. So it doesn't start and stop. I ask that you'd help each person here today to get serious about their time with you. I thank you that you, you welcome us, you invite us to come with confidence before your throne of grace and that you invite us in your word over and over to come to you. We do come to you now today on behalf of the hands that were raised, all the different people that are represented by those hands that here in the auditorium and even folks that are watching online have requests that are on their hearts. I pray you'd meet those needs physically, spiritually, emotionally, financially, in every way. And again, I thank you that you know what we need. So we trust you to provide for each need. And we thank you in advance that you're doing that. I do pray for our country. America has drifted far, far away from our origins from our original Judeo-Christian principles. America desperately needs God and America desperately needs revival. I pray that believers would not get discouraged by how wicked the world's getting. Help us to keep praying and keep believing. Help us to recognize that the effectual fervent prayers of a righteous people avail much and that we can come before your throne of grace for our country. I pray for the president, for the vice president, for the members of the president's cabinet, for the Supreme Court, for the members of Congress, help them to govern according to truth and make righteous judgments. I would ask that believers, Christians, would recognize that the, the, the ills and the, the sins of America and the problems with America will not be solved by political solutions. They'll only be solved with spiritual solutions. So help us to seek your face for the solution to our nation. I pray for the men and women in the military, keep them safe and bring them home safely to their families. I pray for believers in the Ukraine, in Moldova, in Albania, in the Crimea countries, all those countries surrounding there where the, there's the, th the grave threat of war. We know that right now there are believers that are going through all kinds of persecution, not just there, but in China, in communist China, in North Korea. So wherever believers are suffering persecution, I ask that you would uh, protect them, protect the missionaries that are seeking to give the gospel out. In India, India we know is a, is a Hindu nation, and there's not religious freedom in India like, they're, like they say. So I pray for protection for your people. Help them to look to you and not be frightened. I pray for the men and women that are working in law enforcement. Keep them safe as they go out each day to serve and protect and bring them home safely to their families each night. Help us as a church to recognize that right now is the time that you have placed us here to be your witnesses, to be a lighthouse. You've set our church here on this hill 
to be a lighthouse for Jesus Christ. It'll help us to recognize that and to understand what we can do to let our light shine so people can see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. I do pray for all the people that are sick, those that are suffering in the hospitals, those that have COVID, those that have flu and other illnesses. Touch them and raise them up. Those that are sick at home with sore throats and colds, we pray for them. We ask that you would minister your healing to them. And I pray for the spiritual needs of people. Many people are suffering from great depression and anxiety and worry and fear. And I ask that you would heal them emotionally and spiritually as well as physically. Help us to understand that the very best thing we can do for people is to pray for people and to help people where we can and then also to give them encouragement from your word your promises. So help us today to grab a hold of the promises that you've given us and to understand them and apply them to our own hearts and then share them with somebody else. Bless your word as it goes out. We thank you for your promise that will not return to you empty, but will accomplish the purpose for which you send it. And so we thank you in advance for what you are going to do we ask all this in the strong name of Jesus, our Savior, with thanksgiving. Amen. Now, if you're here in the auditorium, I invite you to open your bulletin to the outline. And I invite you to open your Bible. We're going to give the last message today in this series. And for those that want to know what's next, I'll be glad to tell you, since next Sunday is February what, 13th, and people tend to think about love, I thought God's been speaking to my heart from the, the chapter in the, in the Bible called 1 John, 1 John chapter 4. That's a great chapter about love. I'm going to preach a series of messages. I don't know how long it's going to take. doesn't matter. I have as many weeks as it takes. But if you want to read in advance, I encourage you to do that. Study 1 John chapter 4. Now, the whole book's a good book, but I'm not going to teach the whole book. I'm going to teach chapter 4, all right, in the coming weeks. And it'll be centered around love. There's an interesting first part of that that talks about the spirit of Antichrist. And that's kind of interesting. Not the Antichrist, but the spirit of Antichrist, all right? So don't, don't read it now, <laughs> but that'll be, that's the next series that we're going to do, all right? From God's Word, verse by verse, through the chapter, 1 John chapter 4. What day is it? What day is it? Big idea. Whether you know it or not, this is true, okay? Whether you know it or not, or whether you believe it or not, this is true. Today is the day that should matter most to everyone. Let's say it out loud together. Today is the day that should matter most to everyone. Say it one more time. Today is the day that should matter most to everyone. Now open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 3, and I'm going to read Hebrews chapter 3 and chapter 4. And there's a lot of scripture to read, and I would encourage you to follow along if you have a hard copy of the Bible, follow along in it, and uh, if you have a digital version, that's fine, use that. In your hard copy, I I'm going to suggest that you do as I've done and circle or underline at least one word that occurs frequently, all right? And once again, if you don't mind standing in reverence to the Word of God, go ahead and stand up right now as I read, and you can follow in your, in your Bible or there on the screen, 
And I want you to notice the word today, all right? The word today. And in your Bible, you might want to mark it. We're going to start in verse 7 and go down through chapter 4. Hebrews 3, 7. So it is as the Holy Spirit says, today. Listen to what he says. Do not be stubborn as in the past when you turned against God, when you tested God in the desert. There your ancestors tried and tested me and saw the things I did for 40 years. I was angry with them. I said, they're not loyal to me, have not understood my ways. I was angry and made a promise. They'll never enter my rest. So brothers and sisters, be careful that none of you has an evil, unbelieving heart that will turn you away from the living God, but encourage each other, watch this, while it is today. Help each other. So none of you will become hardened because sin has tricked you. For if we are faithful to the end, trusting God just as firmly as when we first believed, we will share in all that belongs to Christ. Remember what it says today when you hear his voice. Don't harden your hearts as Israel did when they rebelled. And who made God angry for 40 years? Wasn't it the people who sinned, whose corpses lay in the wilderness? So we see that because of their unbelief, they were not able to enter his rest. Chapter 4. God's promise of entering his rest still stands. So we ought to tremble with fear that some of you might fail to experience it. For this good news that God has prepared this rest has been announced to us just as it was to them. But it did them no good because they didn't share the faith of those who listened to God. For only we who believe can enter his rest. As for the others, God said, in my anger, I took an oath. They'll never enter my place of rest, even though this rest has been ready since he made the world. We know it's ready because of the place in the scriptures where it mentions the seventh day. On the seventh day, God rested from all his work. But in the other passage, God said, they'll never enter my place of rest. So God's rest is there for people to enter. But those who first heard this good news failed to enter because they disobeyed God. So God said another time for entering his rest, and that time is today. God announced this through David much later in the words already quoted, today. When you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. Now, if Joshua had succeeded in giving them this rest, God would not have spoken about another day of rest still to come. There, so there is a special rest still waiting for the people of God. For all who have entered into God's rest have rested from their labors, just as God did after creating the world. Let us be diligent to enter God's rest so no one will fail by following the example of those who refuse to believe, refuse to obey. For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes, and he is the one to whom we are accountable. So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. Now, verse 16 is an awesome verse. That if I were you, I'd underline the whole verse in your Bible. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy, and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. And God always adds his blessing to the public reading of his word. Thank you very much. You may be seated. Now, I'm going to warn you in advance that this is a little bit hard to understand, okay? It was hard for me to understand, so it took me a long time to figure it out. And I'm going to do my very best to explain it to you. And, and what we have to understand is, first of all, that there are spiritual lessons that God gives us here from the children of Israel in the Old Testament and from the geography, all right? So I need to give you those by way of background and I need to help you understand a few things, all right? So here, here's some teaching from the Old Testament, from the, the spiritual metaphors of the truths that God gives in the Old Testament. The children of Israel were in bondage in Egypt, all right? They were there for 400 years in bondage till the Exodus. That bondage in Egypt 
represent spiritually. When we say represent, we mean spiritually, okay? It's a spiritual illustration of a sinner's bondage in the world. So the Bible says all of us have sinned and we're slaves of sin. We're in bondage to sin. Now, when Israel was delivered from Egypt, they were delivered by the blood of the Passover lamb. God had said, I want you to take a perfect lamb. I want you to sacrifice it and put the blood on the doorposts. And when I, I'm going to send the death angel through Egypt. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. So every house that had the blood of the sacrifice on the doorpost, the death angel passed by, passed over, all right? And of course, that represents how a sinner who believes on Jesus Christ is delivered from the bondage of sin. Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God. John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So Jesus Christ, God's Lamb, represents how we have been delivered, and he, he delivers us, his death and resurrection. Now, when we get now to Canaan now, the promised land, that's where we start to get into difficulty with kind of traditional beliefs, okay? It was not God's will that Israel remain either in Egypt or the wilderness. God didn't want Israel to stay in the wilderness. His desire was that the people enter their inheritance in the land of Canaan. But when they got to the border of their inheritance, they delayed because they doubted the promise of God. We know that from Numbers chapters 13 and 14. They said, we can't do it. We're not able. The 10 spies, they didn't believe. They saw the giants. They saw the people. But, but watch. There were people who said, we can do it. Moses and Joshua and Caleb. They said, we're able with God's help. But because the people went backwards in unbelief instead of forward by faith, they missed their inheritance. They died in the wilderness. It was the new generation, 20 years of age and younger, that possessed the land and entered into their rest ultimately. But you need to know this. Canaan does not in the Bible represent heaven. Canaan represents to Christians today our spiritual inheritance in Christ. And I know we sing songs about, you know, crossing over Jordan and bound for the promised land and all that. But here's why Canaan cannot represent heaven. When the children of Israel crossed the Jordan River and went into Canaan, I have a question for you, if you know your Old Testament at all. Were there battles all over? Were they done? No, they weren't done. They had to fight the battle of Jericho, right? Right the way you start with an AI, see? Now, when you get to heaven, are you going to have any battles to fight? No. Okay? So, you see? So, and I don't care what songs you sing. That's fine, okay? But I just want you to understand <laughs> what, what God is saying here and what he's not saying here, all right? So, Canaan represents, so... To, to us today, our spiritual inheritance in Christ. Well, if that's the case, then what about the wilderness wanderings? Well, that's very important. The wilderness wanderings, that represents today believers who will not claim their spiritual inheritance in Christ, who doubt God's word, see, and they live in restless unbelief. It does not mean lose your salvation. Now, God was with the children of Israel as they wandered through the wilderness. God is with believers today. But they don't enjoy the fullness of God's blessing. See, they're out of Egypt, but they're not yet in Canaan. Now, with that background, I hope you can understand better one of the key words in this section, which is the word rest, okay? The word rest, you'll see it over and over again in Hebrews 3, 11 and 18 and 4, 1 and 3, 3, 3 and 5 and 8 and 11. There's two different rests that are found in the Old Testament history. You have God's Sabbath rest where he ceased from his creation activities, Genesis 2, 2. You have Israel's rest in Canaan when they were done with all their wars. 
Now, these rests are illustrations of the spiritual experiences of us as Christians today. The Sabbath rest that God did after it created is a picture of our rest in Christ through salvation. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, Jesus said, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you what? Rest. Okay, now watch. That's only verse 28. What about any other rest? Okay, the Canaan rest, that's in Matthew eleven twenty nine 29 and 30. Jesus said, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. You will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus said, if you follow me, I will give you an easy burden. I will give you rest for your soul. You know what your soul is? Your soul is not your body. Your body's, you know, that's the part, you know, that people see. That's the part that, you know, gets, gets sick. It's the part that gets old. <laughs> that's just your, that's your shell. That's all it is. That's like the old preacher's joke about, you know, uh, William Pease. You heard that one? Probably heard it from me 50 times. For those who forgot it, I'll tell you one more time, all right? Walk through the cemetery. And they see on a tombstone this amazing epitaph. Here lies the body of William Pease. Pease is not here. This is just the pod. Pease is shelled out and gone home to God. <laughs> but see, I, I said all the part about the body to say this. Your soul, watch, your soul and your spirit, that's the real you. Okay, your soul is your intellect, your personality, your emotions, your will. Your spirit is your God consciousness, and that's you. Okay, your spirit and soul. So Jesus said, "Come unto me, and I will give you rest." Okay, that's the rest of salvation. And he says, "Take my yoke upon you and learn of me." Watch this. Learn about me. See, and he says, "You can find rest if you learn about me." You can find rest for your soul. And see, that's what people need today. And that's what's lacking today. In a lot of Christians. A lot of Christians. And I'm not, this is not a message of criticism. This is a message, hopefully, will be very helpful. Because I want you to understand that God wants you to have rest for your soul. He doesn't want you to have to wait till you get to heaven to be able to rest. That's the end of the trip. But in the meantime, we're here in this world, see. And the, the, the first rest is the rest of salvation. The second rest is the rest of submission to the Lord. And then the third rest is the rest that all believers will enjoy with God in heaven. And that's in verse 9. There remains, therefore, a rest to the people of God. Now, that word for rest is a Greek word, sabbatismos, a keeping of a Sabbath. See? When we enter into heaven, it's like sharing God's great Sabbath rest with all the labors and the battles ended and over. Okay. Now, remember, it's not a picture, Canaan is not a picture of heaven, but of our present spiritual inheritance in Christ. And believers, watch this, and, and his, this is so, so true. Believers who doubt God's word and rebel against him do not miss heaven. But they do miss out on the blessings of their inheritance today. And they'll suffer the chastening of God. So, when you get eternal life, when you get saved... God's not an Indian giver. God gives you eternal life. And if it's eternal, it has to last forever, all right? You, you know, with me? But does that mean that automatically everything is hunky-dory? No. <laughs> it's a pilgrimage. It's a journey. And what we need to do is we need to understand what we have in Christ, what our inheritance is. 
Now, with that as a background, I'm going to quickly go through the four words, and then we'll, we'll go verse by verse through the, ch the chapter that I just read. So in light of all of that that I just gave you, what day matters most? Okay, well, it's not yesterday. It's not yesterday. In fact, in chapter 3, the writer of the book of Hebrews says, let's take heed. Let's take heed. Take heed to what? To the sad history of the nation of Israel. The important lesson it teaches. It teaches us about unbelief, about the importance of listening to God's Word. Now, in, in Hebrews chapter 3, verses 7 through 19, there are quotes from Psalm 95, 7 through 11. That's God, God's response to Israel's tragic spiritual condition. And think about this, folks. God, God delivered His people from Egypt. God cared for them. God showed His power in a lot of signs and wonders. And they saw it and they benefited from it, but it did not bring them closer to God. It did not make them trust Him more. See, all that God did for them when He, when he took, took them out of Egypt, when He took them through the Red Sea, that didn't benefit them spiritually. It benefited them physically. It saved them from Pharaoh. But spiritually, they hardened their hearts against God. They put God to the test, and God never failed them, yet they failed Him, which tells me the root of every problem is a problem in the heart. The root of every problem is a problem in the heart. See, the people of Israel, except for Moses, Joshua, and Caleb, they erred, verse 10 says of chapter 3, they erred in their hearts. They always go astray in their hearts. What that means is that their hearts wandered from God and God's Word. Verse 12 says they also had evil hearts of unbelief. Now, if you have your Bible, I would suggest that you note that for yourself in verse 12. It says, beware, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. I wrote myself this note on the side margin, and I have a, I'm blessed to have a wide margin Bible, so I, I write lots of stuff to myself. And this is for me, not for my teaching. Here's, here's the note I gave myself. Unbelief is evil. Unbelief. Unbelief is evil. See, we don't, we don't think about it that way. We just think, well, you know, I can't help it. I have a problem believing. God says unbelief is sin. Unbelief is evil. Let that sink in. When we don't believe God, what we are doing is we are calling God a liar. We're saying, well, God, yeah, you helped me in the past, and yeah, you said you did this, but I don't believe you. You're lying. Now, I know you don't like me putting it that way, but that's the truth. That's what that means. When we say we don't believe God, we're saying, God, sorry, your word's not any good. Now, when a person has that kind of an unbelieving heart, the result also then becomes a hard heart. And that's a heart that is insensitive to the Word of God and the work of God. And so hard was the heart of Israel that the people even wanted to go back to Egypt. Imagine that. They got out of Egypt. They had been slaves. They had been tortured. And God saved them and took them out. And when they got in the wilderness, they were, their heart was so hardened, they said, Moses, you brought us out here to die. We want to go back to Egypt. That's stupidity. Excuse my French. I'm sorry. And that's what a hard heart does. They wanted to exchange their freedom under God for slavery in Egypt. Now, as the writer of Hebrews gives all this history, 
to the, to the readers, that spoke to their hearts because they were in danger of trying to go back themselves, see, in the spiritual bondage, not into Egypt, but in the spiritual bondage. And God's judgment fell on Israel in the wilderness at Kadesh Barnea. By the way, Kadesh Barnea was close. Sometime you ought to, don't do it now. But, you know, we talk about the children are wandering in the wilderness 40 years, and we think, boy, that must have been a long trip, you know, a long way to go. For No. When they get to Kadesh Barnea, they're right there. Okay, that's right there at the, at the border. And because they saw giants, they said, oh, Moses, we can't do this. This is not going to work. We're going to get killed. We're gonna, we're, it's never going to happen. Yeah, God took us through the Red Sea and God killed the whole Egyptian army, but God can't take care of those giants. Joshua and Caleb, too. By the way, this is, wh this is why the majority, you don't, don't necessarily just get all excited about what the majority says because Joshua and Caleb were in the minority, okay? Two men. They saw the same giants. And Joshua and Caleb said, well, yeah, they were giants, but so what? Our God's bigger than the giants. God hadn't brought us this far to let us fail now. Let's do it. Let's go in and possess the land. And they didn't want to listen to Joshua and Caleb. And God said, all right, that's fine. You don't want to listen? Everybody that's 20 years and older is going to die wandering in the wilderness. And so for 40 years, they went round and round and round in the desert. Now, God was with them. Uh, we're not talking about losing your salvation. God was with them. God led them. But God said, you're not going into Canaan. You didn't believe. You didn't want it. You didn't think you could have it. So your kids are going to have it. You're not. See? Now, what message does that bring to us today? Well, here's the message. Nobody that's a believer today, whether you're a Jew or Gentile, you cannot go back into the Mosaic legal system since the temple's gone. There's no priesthood. But every believer is tempted to give up his confession of Christ, go back into the world system life of compromise and bondage, especially during times of persecution and suffering. See, right? That's what we're getting to right now. The fires of persecution have always purified the church because suffering separates true believers from the counterfeit. True believers are willing to suffer for Christ, and they hold firmly to their convictions and their confession of faith. We see that in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 6, and verse 14. Or look at verse 6. He, he said, hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. We, verse 14, if we, we have become partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of the confidence steadfast to the end. Now, watch this. It does not mean that we are saved by holding to our confession. The fact that we hold to our confession is the proof that we're God's children. In other words, if you're really a child of God through faith in Christ, you will not, not deny the Lord. Okay? And the fact that you don't deny Him, that's the proof that you're God's child. But there are a lot of false professors today, aren't there? There are a lot of phony believers. You, did you know that? Phony Christians? Yeah. <laughs> and guess what? When push comes to shove, and those phony Christians are said, hey, you need to deny your faith in Jesus Christ or we're going to kill you. They'll say, oh, well, now, wait a minute. No, I don't, no, don't want to die. See? And they say, that, no, I'm not one of those. And by the way, folks, I'm not a prophet. I'm not, I'm not trying to predict anything here, but the day could come down the road where you will have to decide whether you're going to stand for Jesus Christ and die or deny him and live. And I mean prior to the tribulation. I mean before the tribulation, okay? 
because there are there is persecution right now around the world against believers around the world especially in countries that don't have the the tradition that we have of religious freedom okay and ours ours is getting real tenuous at best okay because uh, they, they used this whole thing in the last couple of years to shut down a whole bunch of churches across the country. And again, what we need to do is wake up. And verse 12 says, beware, beware. See, it's important to take heed and recognize the spiritual dangers that exist. Verse 13, it's important that we exhort one another daily. It's also important we encourage each other to be faithful to the Lord. That's verse 13. See, today, while it, while it said today, today. Now, we get the impression as we read the book of Hebrews that some of these believers were careless about their fellowship in the local assembly. You know how I know that? Because in Hebrews 10, 23 to 25, the writer says, Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. So, in that day, there were people who were beginning to forsake the assembling of believers. Is, is that happening today? Now, now be careful, and I'm... I'm I'm walking the tightrope here. I'm not talking about people who have physical conditions and can't come. But guess what? I, I, I think I am seeing across the country that it has become easy for people to become bedside Baptist and just stay in bed. And say, oh, well, I'll just watch it online. Now, you say, well, what's wrong with that? Watch this. Here's, here's what's wrong with it. Hebrews 10, 25. Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together like the manner of some is, but, now watch, here it is, here it is, but encouraging one another, one another, you see that? And so much the more as you see the day approaching. And the day approaching is the day when Jesus Christ comes back. And God says that we need to encourage one another that much more, that means be together. You can't encourage somebody when you're sitting at home and watching something online or on the TV. I'll well, probably you can encourage is anybody in the room there with, that's it, okay? And again, I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying to blast anybody. I'm just trying to help you see what the Bible's saying here, okay? The sin of Israel is stated in Hebrews 3.12, departing from the living God. Now, the Greek word gives us our English word apostasy. This is the only place that word's used in Hebrews. So let's, describe, let's define it quickly. Does apostasy mean abandoning one's faith and therefore being condemned forever? No, that does not fit into this context. Israel departed from the living God by refusing God's will for their lives and stubbornly wanting to go back their own way to Egypt. God did not permit them to go back to Egypt. He disciplined them in the wilderness. God did not allow his people to return to bondage. Now, here's the emphasis. The emphasis in Hebrews <coughs> is that true believers have an eternal salvation because they trust a living Savior who constantly intercedes for them. But the writer is careful to point out this confidence is no excuse for sin. God disciplines his children. So if you say you're a child of God and you're living in sin, God's going to discipline you. God's going to spank you. And I'm sorry, that's not politically correct, but that's biblically correct, okay? And you can find that teaching in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 6 through 8. God says, whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you are enduring chastening, God's dealing with you as his sons. For what son is he and the father does not discipline? If you are without chastening, watch, of which all ALL are partakers, then God says you're illegitimate. In other words, you're not saved. Now, that's not me saying you're not saved. God says, if I don't chasten you when you live like a devil, when you live in sin, if I don't chasten you, that's because you don't belong to me. I don't spank the devil's kids. See, that's what God's saying. Okay? So, so when we preach eternal salvation, we're not telling people, oh, yeah, get saved, and then you can live like the devil. You have a license to sin. That's not what the Bible says, okay? So the best thing to do about yesterday is to make sure there was a time in your life when you accepted and received Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. And then remember that Canaan's not a picture of heaven, 
but of your present spiritual inheritance in Christ. Don't doubt God's word. Don't disobey. Don't rebel against him because you'll miss out on the blessings of all that you can enjoy right now in Jesus Christ. So it's not yesterday. It's not tomorrow. Number two, tomorrow might never come. Let me give you a scripture verse for that. I didn't put it on the PowerPoint. I'll give you a scripture verse for that. You want a scripture verse? Here it is. Matthew 6, 34. Take no thought for what? Tomorrow. Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient to the day is the evil, the trouble thereof. You got enough to worry about today, God says. Forget about tomorrow. And this doesn't mean you don't make plans and stuff like that. It's talking about not fretting, okay? And not someday. Someday is just an extended tomorrow. Someday is just an extended tomorrow. People put it off. They'll say, someday I'll do that. No, you won't. Today, number four, today. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. So in Hebrews 4, God says he said another time for entering this rest of that time is today. So let me quickly now go through chapter 4 with you, okay? Several things God wants us to do, okay? Number one, let us fear. That's verses 1 through 8. Let us fear. Now, now watch. When it says fear there, it's not meaning be afraid. It means be careful. Watch out so that this does not happen to you. We, we need to make sure that we don't disbelieve God's Word. It's only as God's Word is mixed with faith that it can help us. It can accomplish its purposes. God said that a rest is still available. This means that Joshua did not lead Israel into the true rest because a rest still remains. That rest, of course, is the rest that God wants to give us. The Canaan rest for Israel is a picture of the spiritual rest we find in Christ. When we yield and learn of him and obey him by faith, we enjoy our submission rest. Salvation rest is when we come to Christ by faith. Submission rest is when we yield and obey him. So here's another way to say that. The first one is peace with God, Romans 5.1. The second is the peace of God. Do you see the difference? Peace with God means you get saved and you have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what about peace in your heart? That's the peace of God, Philippians 4, 6 through 8. You want the peace of God that passes understanding? God says, hey, here's how you get it. Be anxious for nothing. Be anxious about nothing. Don't worry. But in everything... By prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God, and watch the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep, will guard your heart and your mind. See, it's not talking about heaven, it's talking about right now. Will guard your heart and mind through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's the peace of God. We obey God by faith. And we surrender to his will, and we understand his rest. Number two, let us labor. Let us labor. That Give diligence is a good translation there. Let us be diligent to enter God's rest. Diligence is the opposite of drifting. How do we give diligence? By paying close attention to the word of God. Israel did not believe God's word, so the rebels fell in the wilderness. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now, in comparing God's word to a sword, verse 12, the writer is not suggesting that God uses his word to slaughter the saints. The emphasis is on the power of the word to penetrate and expose the heart of man. See, God's word is a discerner or a critic of the heart. The Israelites criticized God's word instead of allowing God's word to judge them. Now, God sees our hearts, but we don't always know what is there, do we? Let me show you that. The Bible says in Jeremiah 17, 9, now listen, 
because I, I just understood this as I was studying this this week. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Now listen, listen. Who can know it? You know what that means? That means that we don't really know the depths of depravity that's in our own heart. We don't know. You might think you do, but we don't know. You don't know what you could do. You don't know what's, what sin you could commit. You don't know what murder you could. You don't know. We don't know. God does. And that's why, watch, that's why we need his word because his word, see what it says? It says God's word is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So that means what I need to do is I need to look into the mirror of God's word to show me my own heart. Okay? And if I fail to, and by the way, the number one reason, I'm going to just stick my neck out here and I'll make a, I'll make a statement. I can't, I can't back it up with any statistics, but I'll make a statement. The number one reason why so many Christians are weak and messed up in, in all kinds of ways is because they do not read God's Word daily. They do not. And if you don't read God's Word daily, then you will be weak and you will be easy, easy target for the devil and for, for Satan as a roaring lion to try to mess you up, okay? I didn't say lose your salvation, but just totally destroy your testimony. So what we need to do is be diligent to apply ourselves to hear and, and heed God's word. In the word we see God, we also see how God sees us. We see ourselves as we really are. And that's all possible because of the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. The two he's in verse 10 refer to Jesus Christ. God rested when he finished the work of creation. God's son rested when he completed the work of the new creation. We also enter into his rest by trusting his word and obeying his will. Now, before Joshua conquered Jericho, he went out to survey the situation and he met the Lord Jesus Christ, Joshua 5, 13 to 15. That's what we call a Christophany. You know what a Christophany is? It's an appearance of Christ in the Old Testament. And Joshua met the Lord, the captain of the Lord. He met the Lord. Joshua discovered he was second in command. The Lord had a sword in his hand, and Joshua fell at his feet in complete submission. It was this action, that action that caused Joshua to go in and have victory publicly. That action in private. You and I need to have privately our submission to the Lord and to his word and to what he says so that we can publicly have the victory. And that leads us to the last thing. Let us hold firmly. Verses 14 to 16. Let us hold firmly. So then, since we have such a great high priest who entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let's hold firmly to what we believe. That word translated profession means confession. Number one, there's no need in giving up our profession just because we're going through testing and trial. There's no need to give up your profession of faith in Christ because you're going through testing and trials. That's what's happening to a whole bunch of people today who are doing the whole deconstruct thing, see? They ran into all kinds of stuff that they, they, they couldn't handle, and they said, God failed me. Now, these Hebrew Christians were tempted to give up their confession of faith in Christ. And it wasn't a matter of giving up their salvation, but a matter of their public confession of faith. Jesus Christ, our great high priest, is enthroned in heaven. And he ministers mercy and grace to those who come for help. Now, this is, a, this is I could preach a whole sermon just on this verse. Listen to this. Mercy means God does not give us what we deserve. Grace means he gives us what we do not deserve. 
No Old Testament high priest could minister mercy and grace like that. As believers in Christ, we can run to our high priest Jesus at any time in any circumstance and find the help we need. So there's no need to go back because we can come boldly to the presence of God and get the help we need. You know what that word boldly means? It means with confidence, with confidence. See, I can go boldly, not because of me, because I'm nothing, I'm a sinner, okay? So it doesn't matter who my mom and dad were, doesn't matter who my family is, I'm a sinner saved by grace. But I can come with confidence to God's throne of grace because of Jesus. And so can you. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, God says, I want you to come with confidence to my throne of grace to find mercy and grace to help in our time of need. Today, if you hear God's voice, today, today. Do it now. See. Trust God now. Believe God now. Obey God now. And let God bless you and give you the spiritual blessings that he wants to give you through his son, Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads, please, for prayer. With our heads bowed and eyes closed and no one looking around, let me ask you this question. If you died today, do you know for certain you'd go to heaven? Do you have eternal life? Do you have eternal life? Have you trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? If you have not, then do it today. I invite you right there where you sit, right there where you're at, in your home, in your car, wherever you're watching this. I invite you to humble yourself before God and pray this prayer with me from your heart of heart to God's. Dear God, thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for my sins. Thank you that Jesus invites me to come to him and he wants to give me rest. I need salvation. I need eternal life. I need my sins forgiven. Come into my life. Forgive my sins. Make me your child. Thank you for hearing my prayer. Thank you for saving me. Help me now to live my life for you. And day by day, obey and follow you. In Jesus' name I pray. Well, their heads still bowed and eyes still closed. If you prayed that prayer a minute, I believe God heard you and saved you. I'd like to thank him for doing that if you'll let me. If you pray with me a minute ago, would you lift your hand right now? By that raised hand, you're saying, yes, I prayed to accept Jesus Christ today as my Lord and Savior. And it's very possible everybody here in the room has already done that. If you're watching us online and you just did it today for the first time, I invite you to let us know. Text me or put it in the comment section there or email me, whatever works. And let us know so we can help you grow. You need to daily read the Word of God and pray. If you don't have a Bible, we'll give you one. Just let me know you need one. Christian friend, maybe today God opened up to you some, some portion of His Word that you needed to see about rest, about spiritual rest in Christ. And maybe, maybe you understand now the importance of God's Word in your life to help you grow, to help you have rest. And you'd say, Pastor Bill, I'm, I'm a believer, I'm a Christian, but God's shown me something today that I need to take care of, I need to do, I need to put into place in my life as a Christian. Here's my hand as a believer, please pray for me, I want to be obedient to what God's telling me. Yes, God bless you, and you, and you, many hands. Thank you, Father, that you love us, that you're patient, and you're long-suffering. Thank you for your word, your, the way it convicts us, the way it helps us, the way it uh, provides what we need. Bless these dear folks who raise their hands. Help them to do what your word tells them to do. What your Holy Spirit spoken to them today. And help us all to be good ambassadors for Christ so that we can, we can share with a world that's messed up, with a world that's full of people full of fear and worry and doubt and unbelief. Why we have hope because of Jesus Christ, because of your word. Thank you, Father, that you're working. Thank you that you're still working and that you don't ever give up on us. Help us to enter in through faith and belief 
and not go back and not give up. Give you praise and thanks and ask it all in the strong name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. I want to ask the praise team to come to the platform. Let's stand together. And I couldn't think of a better song for us to sing after we get done with a message about today than a, than a simple praise chorus. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Let's sing it together. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day. By the end of that, some of you were catching it, right? <laughs> How many never sang that song before this morning? Anybody? A few here. All right, let's do it again. It sounded like half of you didn't know it, all right? Let's sing it one more time, and this time, if, if this is the day that you're going to rejoice, then there's one more helpful thing you can do for me, and I'll do the same for you, okay? Wow. Notify your face. Smile, okay? Smile. And it will be easier for you to sing. We will rejoice. All right, let's sing it together. This is the day, is the day that the Lord has made. That the Lord has made. We will rejoice. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And be glad in it. This is the day. Wednesday night, we have Awana, and we have the pastor's Bible study down the hall, room 114. Uh, Thursday, we have our senior Bible study. And by the way, a senior is anybody 55 and older, and we don't check ages at the door, okay? <laughs> so anybody that's free and wants to come, you're welcome to come, okay? You don't, uh, sometimes I think we should get another, another word for that, because people say, well, I'm not a senior yet, so I don't need, uh, well, you know, uh, if you enjoy fellowship with other believers, okay, and by the way, here's what's cool about my Wednesday night Bible study. It's very intergenerational. I got a guy that's 30 to 40 years old that comes and drives all the way from, from uh, somewhere down York Springs or somewhere just to come Wednesday night. He works Sunday mornings. He can't come, but he comes. Really, I've known him since a little boy, okay? And he comes, and people of all different ages come. So, you know, the, the Bible, the thing that people want is the Word of God, okay? That's what we offer, okay? And so if you're interested in learning the Bible, then you, you're welcome to come Wednesday night, Thursday, whenever you can, and uh, we'll trust that God will give you what you need for your Christian spiritual life. Let's bow our heads and hearts together in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you today for your blessing. You have told us in your word that it's your desire that you bless your people and that we can receive your blessing if we will obey you and we will believe you and we can enter into great, great peace. We know that the world doesn't offer peace. We know that the, the news media and the culture today does not offer peace, but you do. So help us to not allow ourselves to be messed up by the world's confusion, by the world's uh, crazy upside down backwards situation. Help us to solidify ourselves, to stabilize ourselves with the Word of God, 
so that not only we can have peace ourselves, so that we can give peace to other people, so we can give hope to other people. Thank you for meeting with us today. I thank you for your word. I pray that you would continue to use it in my heart, use it in each one of our hearts, that we might believe you and receive from you all that you have for us in Jesus Christ. We thank you that we are accepted in him. And there's nothing we can do to make you love us anymore. So help us to trust and obey you and walk by faith, not by sight. Dismiss us now with your blessing. And I pray a special blessing upon each one that's here today. We'll give you praise and thanks and ask it in Jesus' strong name. And all of God's people said, amen. amen. Thank you very much.